that far. Cheers. But Sean McDermott had a, a very commanding quality, something like Mick Collins subsequently. He, he, he could impress his will on one people, make them do what he wanted them to do, and not count the cost. That's, uh, it's very important, you know, that you come along to these meetings because, because we need the support. And the more people come along, if you tell your friends, it's an important cause. It's as important as winning that game out there. No, we'll be there. We'll be there. Yeah. Around 7.30. 7.30. Half past yeah. seven. Sean McDermott, though, was born in January 1883 in the townland of Curranmore, close to Kilty Clogher in County Leitrim an area where the landscape was scarred by reminders of poverty and oppression. Surrounding McDermott uh, in a rural area like uh, Cornmore, North Leitrim, there were reminders of Irish history throughout the area. Um, there was a, an ancient sweat house, there were mass rocks, so you would have heard about the penal times and the persecutions of, of the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and his father, of course, would have, would have pointed out all the deserted homesteads um, as a result of the, the famine of the uh, 1840s. His father actually lived through it. He was a teenager at the time. Also then, in, in, in 1898, uh, um, not only did he hear about what was happening in, in terms of during the famine period, but he saw his neighbours being evicted by the local landlord, Tottenham. McDermott was at 15 years of age, a very important age in terms of his formation, and here he was, about 100 people were evicted by Tottenham in the local area. McDermott attended the local primary school and did well enough to go on to sit the state examinations in order to qualify as a teacher. But he failed the test and decided to leave home, moving first to Glasgow, where he worked as a gardener, and then on to Belfast, where he found work as a tram conductor. McDermott arrived in Belfast in the spring of 1905. Belfast was a bustling Edwardian city at that stage. The Belfast City Hall was just being built um, on the site of the old Linen Hall. And it was one of the, regarded as one of the major cities in the British Empire. And key to McDermott's arrival there was the tram system. And he was there as a probationer for a couple of months. He then achieved a full-time post but was sacked in July 1905 when he was caught smoking on his platform. He was a conductor and he was caught smoking and he was out of a job. Aye, sure. And yourself? Good. Okay. Tom, two more Guinness, okay? Sure. How you doing? Oh, you <laughs> Be back for those. I'm going to deal with this disaster over here. McDiarmada found part-time work as a barman, and with more free time on his hands, he became active in the various political and cultural movements that were taking off at this time in the city. Dennis <laughs> Vishdegira Soshkel and Fabloch, a scap, a reached, the Glushat and Pabloch, the Gasfu Brauchas and Pabloch, the Kuhn Gama, a Gascon Mor on a show, Akab, Ach, Vins Ramsha, a Gira, Sprids no Hurs and Loshot, Agas, Clack Maxim with the parts and Obravia show, like a Shinoke or Honic Shesh, Dach, Sin Loshot Nashon. No problem. I'm looking forward to it, Dennis, you know. And now is the time, Bulmer. All right, men. Sean, how are you? Good, good. good yourself? Good, good. Not so bad now. How's about you, Sean? Dennis, how are you? Bulmer Hobson came from, uh, unusually, from a Quaker background in the north of Ireland. And from a very early age, he got interested in the Gaelic League, um, you know, Come in the Gael, all these kind of organisations, and very much interested in a lot of the Sinn Féin ideas that were being um, tossed about at the time. And he had become friends through the Gaelic League with a, a young Catholic man from the Falls Road area called Dennis McCullough. So the two of them became very much partners in nationalism. And they started their own organisation, the Dungannon Clubs, in March 1905 in Belfast. And what they were looking to do was, on one hand, to spread the Sinn Féin movement. But they also had an ulterior motive as well. They were looking for young men um, to get involved with the IRB. And one of the men that they scouted at this time was Sean McDiarmada. I'll see you tomorrow, OK? 
One of the aspects of the Dungannon Club was that they held public meetings. This was their way of, of getting their, their message across. Um, in those days, there were two main ways. The one was the public meeting, and the other one was the newspaper. Uh, the Dungannon Club's availed of both, but first of all, they had to establish themselves uh, locally in terms of having rallies um, each Sunday in various parts of Belfast. And they were regularly heckled, and in some cases, they were looking to get away with their lives. Sean McDermott, and I think this will be interesting what he has to say. Uh, we were, oh, they were dirty, all right, up there. Thank you for coming to listen to us today. Um, just have a few more things I'd like to say. Uh, immigration is too high. We're losing a good men are leaving the country, and they should be kept in Ireland, working for Ireland. At the moment, we're we're just we're just one of England's colonies at the moment. It's not only good for England, and we need to stop serving England and stop serving on our juries. We're just, we're just, we're just going to get nasty. Let's get out of here. Go on, Sean, get out of here. Don't worry, Sean. It takes a while to win this crowd over. In 1906, Sean McDermott was sworn into the Irish Republican Brotherhood by Dennis McCullough. The IRB was a secret society committed to ending British rule in Ireland, and the Dungannon clubs were a front for much IRB activity. McDermott was appointed a full-time organiser for the clubs, a position that assumed greater significance when the Dungannon clubs were amalgamated into a new organisation, Sinn Féin. Capo Macdermot and Marhimera, the Hinfein, a Gogiola, Marshin Vishagul, Temple and Hogia, a Lorte, Crinia, a Gagro, Cravery, a Smarshin Hushat, Nicolor Dina, Agus, Octavo Tigna, Tangwal, who shall these foods are known. You vote for Sinn Fein, and we won't go to Parliament in England. We'll stay here, and we'll rule from here. And England. England and all our institutions must be completely boycotted by Irishmen. The policy of Sinn Féin is to get the fishery in the air and get back to Parliament's Westminster and Parliament's Neavsblach in the air. And the Neavsblach is going to make it a good thing to be able to do it. The policy of Sinn Féin is to get Charles Dolan and to get the Leisha Bartsi Parliament. Zaire Shayasan Sihan of Viega, Westminster, Agus Mayolish and V. Tauchanella, a Gondelitrum, a Mayoler, has Sheshan Rahin Fein and Bautisha, Agus V. Macdirmada, a Zagra and Fachtus. It is time to vote for Sinn Fein. Anyone you know who can vote, get out and vote in that local election and get Sinn Fein into Litrum. They were routed in the election. I mean, the, the election was a foregone conclusion, three and a half thousand votes to about um, 1,500 or so. But uh, the key factor was that this election raised the profile of McDermott and his star was in the ascendant in Republican politics by early 1908. This is our country and we should rule it for ourselves. Sinn Féin! <laughs> Following the Leitrim election, McDermott moved to Dublin City, where he worked closely with Bulmer Hobson in attempting to reinvigorate the Republican movement on a national level. Their efforts were greatly aided by the return from America in 1907 of a man who would have a profound influence on Sean McDermott, Tom Clark. Hobson was invited to go to America and he did a speaking tour to introduce the Sinn Féin movement to America and he was chosen over Arthur Griffith because he was viewed as being a better public speaker. And while he was there, he met Tom Clark. Tom Clark was working in New York at the time, and Clark was actually the organizer of the tour. So the two of them made a connection there. And Hobson is really the one who is key for introducing him to the younger men, people like McDiarmid, like McCullough and others. So Clark in many ways becomes a father figure to them and feels this great sort of affinity with the younger men. And particularly, you get the, the kind of a, a close triangular relationship between Clark, Hobson and McDiarmid. And where are you from? I'm from Leitrim. But when I got sick of me up there, I ended up in Belfast. 
I was drumming up support, you know, for the Dungannon clubs, traveling around a bit. Aye, Dungannon. My hometown. Younger people coming into the IRB was absolutely central to its revitalization. And in a sense, it was submerged. The IRB had been submerged by the bigger political questions, by the home rule question. Um, they didn't have the same kind of presence that they would have liked to have had in the late 19th and the early 20th century. So there is that great sense of, of urgency to try and revitalise it and to, to try and make it relevant again. Um, and it wasn't regarded too seriously by the British authorities in the late 19th and the early 20th century. In 1903, one Dublin Castle official dismissed it as the shadow of a once terrifying name. And that seemed to imply that it wasn't a cause for concern. Uh, and that would have suited some of the, the younger members who were trying to revitalise it in, in a quiet way, I suppose, uh, and build up its influence. But the IRB was always dependent on infiltration and on infiltrating other groups. And there are great opportunities there uh, as you move into the second decade of the 20th century to infiltrate different groups and to use that as an opportunity to get IRB members into serious positions of influence. We miss a Dana Blint and Alskalanuru, the Gashishanam of Pakistan Golden Lail Tart. I guess Hokrame got to a cage, I guess Hahas Shashat and Eons, a large and chin. I guess we may have lost in a jar cheap and see here a sheer on Galasha of Ruach and Locha. Honigan Fadog Shah Fellu, Lodger Ackley, Vieshans, Sean McDermott. In Fadog Jerry, but Dahula is a cheer and no road. I guess I go a go of the air, Jingato, because I am Jira Hajinato, I guess Sula ain't a head, I guess Canal da Crone, Jingato, Ganavaro, Ganavaro Lodger, I guess Colley, Colleen and Ward on 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 Rohrek, I know we are Rohrek and Gale, Hilligan. Near a moron gale gigger, leave young gale gigger. A hache, hache gym no me the gear, rather kin to know. Chicken, we may, we may, in, 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 now don't tell me, don't tell me, hold it. We may, in, 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 Bishop Simple, a foot in the sea, a bono crabbery, a hen vein, a sonam kerner, Bishop Gobber, a whole term, Bukhan Vrahras, a gam shudina, Vachbail, Agus, Visha, a bogger zere hele, or follow sea, sheer hunt a hen vein, a draw, public to us. The law of the law is a matter of the heart is free on her, Tom Clark. Fecking with Lou Galior, a raw good gaffer, trods the law of Lazar, not Lor Enrod, Nislo Nashin, the Green Hassner and Seer, a Wogger. The government are keeping in prison one of the truest Irishmen of the present day. And for what? For shooting a policeman? Of whom there are too many moving about at the present time. The Fenians resorted to physical force. And we will be justified in using it now if the opportunity offered. Any means are justifiable in trying to rent our hereditary enemy out of Ireland. Even, even to scatter the fires of hell in the face of that enemy. So, are you with me, lads? Paddy Murphy. Aidan Curry. Mihal O'Shea. Mihal O'Shea. Why who? I'm Murphy. We stand for not an Irish party, but for national tradition. The tradition of Wolf Tone and Robert Emmett, of John Mitchell and John O'Leary. We stand for the complete and total separation of Ireland from England and the establishment of an Irish government untrammeled and uncontrolled by any other government in the world. 
We do not believe that it is possible to make Ireland a nation by an act of the English Parliament. And we will not ask that Parliament or join with any section of our countrymen in asking it to legislate for us. Come again, obviously showing a bit of interest. What seems to come across is that McDermott, that he was someone who was enormously committed from his teenage years and really devoted his life to tramping the countryside and organising. And the best evidence for that is he got polio in 1912. And as a result of the polio, um, one of his legs was paralysed and he walked on a stick from, from 1912. He was months recuperating from polio. McDermott struggled on, going from town to town, organising, going around Dublin, organising, and trying to enthuse people. At the turning point for a lot of people, including Pierce, as a, as a matter of fact. I mean, Pierce is on record as actually supporting Home Rule if it had gone through. When it didn't, and they regarded they were being betrayed by the British government, they, they went straight past Sinn Féin to physical force. I mean, more and more advanced nationalists, as they were called in those days, came to be convinced that they could not get Home Rule by legitimate parliamentary means. Because in 1912, you have the Covenant, hundreds of thousands of people signing it, and then a not-too-secret provisional government established by the Ulster Unionists. And then the Ulster Volunteer Force founded in early 1913. The Ulster Volunteer Force brought the gun into Irish politics in a very serious way. And what happens in response to the Ulster Volunteer Force uh, increases that notion of an island that's becoming more militarised. Um, open drilling, different private armies effectively, uh, the shipping of arms, you know, the arrival of arms to Ireland, the Larne gun running, the Holt gun running, uh, the tensions involved in that, uh, the degree of tolerance that was there for it as well, because the British government was faced with something of a dilemma there. What do they do in response to this? Do they attempt to, to disarm them? About 1,600 were landed all right at Hoth. The men marched into Clontarf, but the authorities prepared in the meantime, and special trams were chartered to bring out the military and police. Tom and myself were in town on secret duty, so we got our taxi out and met them. The military and police had taken up their positions, and our men had no chance, so we got on the job immediately of taking off the rifles in our taxi. That was our job for the evening, running them to safe places. Several other motor cars and taxis got on the job later, with the result that practically all the rifles have been saved. The crowds in the streets have been charged several times by the military. It'll do good, and all is well. That ought to open the eyes of the fools as to what liberal government is. When the volunteers were launched, Owen McNeill, a professor of history at University College Dublin, was appointed chief of staff. And despite the IRB's orders, Bulmer Hobson put himself forward for the role of secretary of the organisation, much to the anger of both Tom Clark and Sean McDiarmid. Clark and McDiarmid, you know, they didn't want Hobson or anybody from the IRB in too obvious, too public a position, because if it was associated with radicalism, then you wouldn't get that broad spectrum of nationalists getting involved. So there is a real division increasingly growing between Hobson and his vision for the Irish Volunteers and the vision of Clark and McDiarmid. Hobson's a special case because of his scruples being a Quaker about the use of physical force and, and, and much the same applied to Owen McNeill, who's one of these people who was, um, if you like, always making snowballs but never throwing them. I mean, he would write all these incendiary articles. He was heavily involved in, in organising the volunteers. He was heavily involved in organising volunteers drilling. But always when it came to the bit, um, Owen McNeill was noted somewhere up in the spectators' gallery. 
The object proposed for the Irish volunteers is to secure and maintain the rights and The growing rift between Hobson Clark and McDiarmida came to a head in the summer of 1914, when John Redmond, the leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, attempted to take control of the volunteer movement. Well, are those few hours, are John Redmond, August Quiddo, Lachlanunum, or Humpley Joe Devlin, the hours are of Winkle Shot Nusha, Ach, the Enturing Equiticon, Ach, Marshall and Lushot, Ach, Ni Marshall and Horla, August, Fui Hour and Edis Cardio, Castigo Redmond, Smachto, Lern Lushot, Coffer Advoil, Gresha Fane, a bunk cart, a gobintishin, Mar Vitona Cornis Mona, Reev, a gobintishin, a Gentuktori, Ola. Agus vi an chrichialt a flé go forlachan, agus vi tauchi an rialt a stúchis i gest. Mar sin bovúr an chaur ar tlí de John Redmond um, naska i an avleis na hóglig fada deatag sé féin smacht ich mad orhe. The Provisional Committee of the Volunteers voted on the question of admitting Redmond's nominees and the resolution was passed by a majority of 18 votes to nine. The dissenting voters were all IRB men and included Patrick Pierce, Eamon Kant and Sean McDiarmida. Fearing a split in the volunteer movement, Owen McNeil and Bulmer Hobson voted in favour of the resolution. For Clark and McDermott, this effectively was treason. Hobson is effectively called to what is a court-martial, an IRB court-martial. He's confronted primarily by Clark and McDermott, who are absolutely boiling with anger. They went at Hobson like two attack dogs, shouting, literally shouting at him, screaming, uh, you betrayed us. And then Clark throws in, he tops it all. He says to Hobson, how much did the castle pay you? Now, that was the most devastating accusation that you could point at an Irish Republican. Hobson decided to resign from his key positions that brought him into contact with Clark and McDiarmida. So he resigned from the Supreme Council. Uh, he resigned as editor of the Irish Freedom newspaper. Now, years later, he realized this was actually a blunder, that he had played into their hands, because really what you had there was a power struggle had been developing in the IRB between Clark and McDiarmida on one hand and Hobson on the other. Who was going to be the most influential? And with Hobson out of the way, as as one of the key influences within the IRB, it left the road open for Clark and McDiarmida. And their vision had always been for the Irish volunteers to be a tool to be used in a rebellion. Any man entering the volunteer movement must be prepared to take up the demand for self-government. Not only with the sacrifice of time and money, but also, if necessary, with the sacrifice of his life it may be necessary for some of us to offer ourselves as martyrs, if nothing better can be done, to preserve Irish national spirit and hand it down for generations to come. Following the outbreak of the Great War, McDiarmida continued to organise IRB and volunteer units across the country. The threat of conscription had galvanised support for the separatist movement, and more and more people began to rally to McDiarmida's cause. Old men here say that they never saw such a tremendous gathering in Cork, not even Parnell's meetings. If you try to imagine a dense mass of people packed together in O'Connell Street, from the Parnell Monument to the Nelson Pillar, it'll give you some idea of the crowd. But the enthusiasm of the people or rather their earnestness was what impressed me most. There's no doubt in the feeling of the people. The country is with us. Sean McDermott got on with every person, I think. And he was really uh, very attractive. A uh, very attractive man and interesting. He was an interesting person as well. 
Minran referred to Sean as being like a general secretary of several unnamed societies. She could never rely on him being there. He was always apologising. In those days, they wrote letters almost on a daily basis and they were sent by courier. They were never sent through the post, or very rarely they were always sent by an IRB courier. But um, he was always devoted towards one thing, and it wasn't Minran, it was Irish Republicanism. I didn't know at all that there was going to be such a thing as a rising. I let, never let my mind dwell on, on that. I was in that movement, and it really is just was a part of my life, I think. I had no idea of what he had on his mind. It was far more than I could have possibly imagined. We call on the people of this land to remember the mighty dead, those who gave their lives for this country. Let us remember Robert Emmett, who died for this country, for Ireland. The loafers are getting very interested in what I have to say. McDermott is a very German name, you see. <laughs> to hell with England! <laughs> Let her fight her own battles! <laughs> the volunteers fight for nobody except Ireland! Two months in jail bear a terrible significance. If I went to jail charged with some crime, it'd be hard to feel in good spirits. But what is my crime? Look back all through our history and you can find what my crime is. In prison, everything depends on the state of one's mind. My mind is at ease. My conscience is happy. When McDermott was released in September 1915, he and Tom Clark joined Patrick Pierce, Joseph Plunkett and Eamon Kant on the military council that was planning the rising. Clark and McDermott, they have various fears. They have fears that the British will get to know of what they're planning and swoop on them. And then also they had a fear that McNeil and Hobson might ruin their plans. McNeil was a useless politician. He was lazy, naive, gullible. And they would have been quite content for him just to remain there as a figurehead uh, that they could manipulate. McNeil's not quite prepared to do that. He's got a high opinion of himself and he regards himself as the real head of the volunteers. So what they do is they, uh, they bypass him, they ignore him. Time and again, they sucker McNeil. He falls uh, for their deceptions. So they don't regard him as much of a threat. The real danger person that they see is um, Boomer Hobson. Only in the f days before the rising do they become concerned about McNeil, and then what they do is, rather than bypass him or ignore him, they co-opt him. We need McNeil with us. Some of the volunteers believe that he's leading them as much as he believes it himself. Tell me, what are we supposed to do about Hobson? Don't worry about Bulmer. He's an old friend of mine, I'll take care of him. One of the reasons why the IRB kidnapped Hobson on Good Friday was because they wanted to get him away from McNeil. So he was basically held in this house in Cabra Park um, from Good Friday, probably about the late afternoon of Good Friday, until the evening of Easter Monday. And the whole idea was to get him out of the way, that he was too influential, that he could put a spanner in the works, and that they couldn't... And, and again, they were looking to, to keep him away from McNeil, whom they had hoped that they would be able to influence. Sean. Oh. Dear God. Jesus, my right. What do you want? You said that if the volunteers were armed, you'd be ready for an insurrection. I did, I. Well, we're getting arms. From Germany. 30,000 rifles. And German men, trained men, to lead the insurrection in the West. This is a firm commitment. This weekend. 
volunteers will be armed. Properly. Finally. It's the chance we've been waiting for. The secrecy was necessary. You know. But the men look up to you. We need you with us now. I understand. You have me. Good man. Now, I've got a wee bit of business to attend to. Owing to the very critical situation, all orders given to the Irish volunteers for tomorrow, Easter Sunday, are hereby rescinded. And no parades, marches or other movements of Irish volunteers will take place. Each individual volunteer will obey this order strictly in every particular. MacNeil had been told everything about the rising and MacDermott told me that uh, MacNeil was making trouble. Mm. And uh, he had definitely, this is MacDermott's statement to me, he had definitely agreed to t take part in the rising and for that the volunteers should take part. But now he was changing his mind. The same countermand has been sent out to every volunteer circle in the country. We'll be lucky to have a hundred men turn up. Be far again, war, er wax erma de Nora Hulish, Graham MacNeil, Hesh, Ibrich, the Nolach, Yarashat and the Kosk, Hora Kal. Near one, Grisha Ratsek MacNeil, less shoed, Gamoshe Takul, Shnaidimach. Ach vi hosluch der gur hen rod de gul tit som asig hele ag es chosis en an imri gudzoer. Enough, enough, gentlemen. Now I say we go immediately, and I'll take as many men that will follow. Gentlemen, as members of the provisional government, we are no longer obliged to abide by consensus. So we'll put it to a vote. All those in favour of staying with the original plan, raise your arm. Come on, lad. Sean? Sean? All those in favor of postponing operations for 24 hours, raise your arm. We strike at noon tomorrow. Very well. <coughs> I'll draft up new orders and make sure they are distributed to the men of the Western branches. We have to get word out that we're on hold for 24 hours. Tell the men to stand down, but to be ready. <coughs> A few minutes before midday on Easter Monday, the 24th of April, 1916, Sean McDermott and Tom Clark stood waiting outside the General Post Office at the corner of Princess Street and O'Connell Street. Because of McDermott's lameness and Clark's age, they had decided not to march with the rest of the battalion from Liberty Hall. But nothing would keep either man from taking his place alongside the rebels in the GPO. Clark and McDermott, on the first day they were seen sitting on the meals counter and their faces were beaming because this was the common fruition of, in McDermott's case, almost 10 years of work on, on behalf of Republicanism. And in the case of Tom Clark, it was a, a lifetime's. And it's almost a case of no matter what happened after this, at least th there had been an insurrection. <coughs> Sean, Tom, O'Reilly. O'Reilly. 
things are going well. Good day. Hmm? As there's an issue outstanding that I think we need to deal with. Hobson. It was at the request of the O'Rahilly and Pierce Beasley that McDiarmida finally signed orders that Hobson could be released. So Sean T. O'Kelly took the order to the house in Cabra Park and uh, Hobson was let out. If he can change his mind and come and support us, maybe Bulmer will turn up at the door as well. <laughs> maybe. Stranger things have happened. Hobson could have joined the Rising after he was released, but he chose not to. And he really felt that the Rising was a blunder. And it's, it's ironic in, in many ways that Hobson kind of gets written out of things and he, he gets pushed out of the nationalist movement after 1916 because you could argue that, that the Easter Rising wouldn't have happened without him and all the work that he did. And, you know, he had a very different life after 1916. Headquarters, Irish Republican government. Report to Ned Daly and release Hobson. Everything splendid. Sean McDee. Fargal. Coming to Connolly. Looters are inside half the street. We've just come from City Hall. We're under heavy fire. We need more men. Fire over the heads, that should clear them. We've already tried that, sir. So just keep coming back. We'll leave them alone unless they attack you. Sir. Just heard. The men up in City Hall are under heavy fire. We need to send reinforcements. We're stretched to breaking point as it is. See what I can do. As time goes on, however, during Easter week, as Pierce becomes exhausted, Connolly's injured, Clark and McDermott come more into their own. By the end of the week, they're actually taking decisions. They're sending people to various locations. They're evacuating various garrisons. There's at least 16, sir. They're seriously bad. Oh, fine. Prepare them to transfer to Jervis Street Hospital. Please, wait. Come on. German, you need to send word to the posts on Moore Street and Middle Abbey Street. Tell them to withdraw to the GPO. Yes, sir. Good novel. Oh, good rest. An insurrection. That certainly is revolution deluxe. We got those hoses. It wasn't only the GPO was on fire. Uh, Dublin was a furnace. I mean, the opposite side of the street, where Cleary's is today, was on fire. Uh, paint f uh, companies went up. You can imagine what that looked like. I um, interviewed people who stood on um, the Hill of Hoth and out in Killiney Hill and watched the fires burning. And you could see Lenson's pillar in the fire from Hold. Do you know what they're doing that for? With them out of the way, they can get a good bang at us. No, Sean. That's not the reason. They want you and me to know exactly what they think of Ireland. We did the right thing, so, didn't we? By Friday, the fires had overtaken the GPO, and that evening the rebels were forced to abandon it. The next day, they surrendered. 
they were rounded up and held in Richmond barracks to await trial. Nor Gaum Maxim Zero Hation Idemar, Lakshelesh, Galua, Nakred Desher Behege, Ganelo Shell and Vaha, Visege Gurfi Hun Bashe, Achla Wan, Vishanson, Ganelo Shay, Togosloa Prison of the Hale, Agus Vishi Lenastro, Gazi Prison Assassino, Agus Vimaxim Rade, Esche, Sasloa Shin, Marshin Vinshanson, Ganelo Shay, on on Mars Eregation, Achaganome Zera Agasid Le Turts Hun Bali. Dahan Blachter, Maxirmada, took over Machas Lotion, Agus Quinny of Samaraki, Agus Martian Kuriveda Eritreale. We were, had hoped very much, as the executions had stopped for a good while, that himself and Connolly were going to escape. But uh, then we knew, of course, definitely. So we saw him then in his cell. Can you get down to Winnie? I will. McDermott um, was visited by the Ryan sisters uh, right up until um, the last moment. Um, there is an account that McDermott has sat between the two of them and put his arms around them and he, he also in a sense was quite satisfied and quite content of what he achieved during Easter week. And uh, there's also a very moving account that um, um, they had a number of, they had between the three of them they managed to gather a couple of pennies and they managed to uh, convince one of the guards who was on, on duty for a pen knife and uh, McDermott has scratched his initials into these pennies and also cut a number of his buttons off his, off his clothes uh, as keepsakes. That's for Julia. I'll give it to her, Sean. She can sew it onto one of her dresses. So we stood up promptly when the priest arrived and felt a great jerk, I'm sure, all of us. And we all said goodbye. I was the last to say goodbye to him. And uh, uh, he kissed me and, and said, just said, did we, we never thought that, we never thought it would end like this. That's all, that this would be the end. Yes, that's the, all he said. Although he knew to be the end himself long before that. Sean McDiarmada, before paying the penalty of death for my love of Ireland and abhorrence of her slavery, desire to make known to all my fellow countrymen that I die as I have lived, bearing no malice to any man and in perfect peace with Almighty God. The principles for which I give my life are so sacred that I now walk to my death in the most calm and collected manner. I meet death for Ireland's cause, as I have worked for the same cause all my life. God save Ireland. Sean McDermott. is 
there I'd sit and cry my fill And every tear would turn a mill It's good day to my poor needs Good day to my